Welcome to another edition of Anglican Unscripted, the second edition recorded in 2021, but I'm still sending my checks 2020, like everybody else. It's the way it goes. I'm Kevin Coulson. And I'm George Conger. Today's January 8th, 2021. All right, welcome to another show. Yes, we're going to talk about that in a minute. But before we do, um, I guys, you know, I, I really appreciate you helping the show out by liking us on Facebook and YouTube. Please go down there and click that little thumbs up. Now, I notice we're only getting like 20% of you clicking the thumbs up and like less than 1% clicking the thumbs down. But if we could up the 20% to 50%, it would really help Facebook and YouTube figure out that this show was worth promoting. It's called free advertising. The comments were alive this week with discussions of last week's show, and we want to encourage you to go to the comment section and follow up for this week's show. This week's show is going to be just as controversial, just as fun as we talk about the things going on in the news around the world. George, how are you doing today? Very good. Lots of hard work. I've got a funeral uh, as soon as we're done here. Uh, people still are born, people still die, no matter what happens in the rest of the world. The, the life of the parish continues. And the life of the church goes on. You know, despite um, what happens externally in the world, the church has to meet that match and better it. Mm -hmm. And you know, we're seeing that with COVID. You know, it's struggling. Times are tough. And uh, a lot of churches, I think, are right now on the precipice. I can't even say the word, are about to start closing. Those who just don't have the fi financial funds anymore, I'm starting to hear rumors that are ju they're just weeks from closing. These are the parishes in the North Wisconsin who only had 30 people to start, um, and some of them died. They don't have any financial support left. I'm hearing about this in Florida and other places around the world. That Just these, the, the ones who were struggling before are, are pretty much finished, George. Have you heard the same? Oh, yes, yes. And in our own life, uh, we've been reevaluating our budget. We've eliminated three positions. And we've decided to invest in growth, meaning we're putting more money into ministry and taking it out of administration and uh, maintenance. Because the view of the vestry, which I share heartily, is that now is the time to invest in growth not in just keep on doing what we've always been doing and assuming that they'll just come to our doors when this is all over. People have lost the church habit, a good many of them. Yeah, the, the weekly attendance, I think, when this is all over, is uh, going to be probably 60 to 70 percent of what it was. Uh, church is really going to have to reboot their ideas of how they do ministry. Uh, I've talked before about how this is the great COVID awakening for the church. It's a reawakening as to what's important, uh, what politics are important, sure, but how the operational parish must meet the match of serving its local congregation, but also at the same time being a global international church through virtual ministries online. We're seeing reports from across the communion, uh, the Anglican Church of Canada its General Synod, Council of General Synod, released a report on uh, DAS and finances for 2020, showing that uh, income was still keeping up, so that they're not at death's door today. But if you go deeper into the paperwork, you'll see they're at death's door next week. Uh, I'm exaggerating, of well, course, but it, it's sooner than later. The, the point being that the uh, the lag between uh, giving and the reality of the situation on the ground is such that it's not been reflected in the numbers so that there's no need for instantaneous dramatic cuts today. Now, I think churches that basically think that way are being short-sighted. Uh, again, I offer my own church. Our pledges came in exactly as promised. Uh, people who had pledged, we hit that number squarely on, and I was surprised by that. What we're missing, of course, is the pledge and plate income, which happens when people give outside of pledging who come on Sunday, so that's missing. And I'm seeing uh, 
new pledges coming in very slowly a few people increasing them most people keeping the same but many people knocking them off a few hundred dollars and with little notes of we just don't know what's going to happen uh, so we're trying to we'll give if the church needs it but we don't want to obligate ourselves in these uncertain times some churches like in Scotland Scotland the the, the, na the, the nation has gone into a, a severe lockdown some parts of England are in such a severe lockdown that I don't think you can go outside your home. Yeah, uh, I, I was reading a, a friend of mine who ha runs a YouTube channel about exercise from England, and she and her uh, video partner left the uh, um, the apartment to do their show, and they were followed by six p police officers to the park, uh, and the whole time they were observed under scrutiny of the... Uh, the Gestapo, if you will, uh, you know, so that they would not get six feet within the six feet boundary of each other. I'm like, man, we have lost it, people. And the other thing we're seeing is the rise of the informers. Uh, they call them Karens in popular media, of people taking it upon themselves to call the police about their neighbors or to upbraid strangers in the post office or the supermarket for not following their idea of what uh, social distancing or good sanitation are. So it's, and the social contract in the past has always discouraged informers, uh, at least in my part of the world, in my uh, milieu, being an informer was the lowest possible thing you could be. You were always loyal to your friends or your gang or to whatever sure. it was. And now the social media and the government is pressing people to inform on their neighbors so kevin as the former president of a homeowners association i know people have a uh, uh this being the president of a homeowners association uh, i think reinforced your belief in the the doctrine of the fallen man uh, <laughs> fallen man but the sorts of people who would complain about you're watering the grass on the day you're not supposed to Mm -hmm. are having a field day with this intrusive government that we're seeing in the wake of COVID. Mm -hmm. And what is so discouraging in all of this, for me, well, lots of things are, but it's the death of experts. You know, if, if I look back at the start of this pandemic in the United States, we had this Dr. Fauci, the head of the, one of the, the government institute tasked with this sort of thing. and. Mm -hmm. He was treated as an all-seeing, all-knowing, un... Uh, uh, George, what you're looking for, he was Yoda. Yoda? He, he was Yoda. Mm -hmm. And if you look, actually, at what he said over the last year, masks are helpful, masks are not helpful, masks are helpful. It spread this way, it spread that way. We're just trying to flatten the curve. We're trying to starve it out. In other words... And now he's said, well, yes, I did exaggerate because I wanted the people to, to, to take this more serious than they were at the time. So what Dr. Fauci has told us is that you can't trust Dr. Fauci. And we're seeing this in so many areas. Uh, you couldn't trust the media, but no, you can't trust the experts. You can't trust the government. You can't trust the courts. You can't trust... Who knows? Who can you trust? Well, the, if you're that, an Episcopalian, you can't trust the bishops? <laughs> or the presiding bishop. I mean, or the but, presiding bishop. We, and that's where we have arrived, is we don't know who to trust anymore because everybody is competing for our ear. There's not three national news sources on TV. There's hundreds, if not thousands. There's not one or two YouTube channels out there telling you what to think, believe, and what you need to know. There are thousands. If you just look at like Apple technology, dealing with the Apple products, there are literally 27,000 uh, active news creative YouTubers who are producing weekly content so you will go to their show. And so we have been ultra saturated by media, ultra saturated by professional and amateur <clears throat> journalists. I am an amateur journalist. George is a professional. You watch this program. Once big, was. Once was. <laughs> but George and I are unique because there's no competition. 
there aren't really two other people uh, who are willing to put their faces on a camera weekly or twice a week and talk about the politics of Christianity and Anglicanism uh, all the time. So we, we have niched out this. We're also, people love our honesty and they know that what they see is what they get. If you've ever wanted a definition of WYSIWYG, that's George and I. We are WYSIWYG. We are what you see is what you get. And I want to, I want to contrast this quickly, George, with um, the events of this week. You watched uh, what was happening at the U.S. Capitol and you're like, oh my Lord. We have, if you are Michael Curry, an insurrection. They're going to try and retake this government and they're going to make slavery uh, legal again. <laughs> and if you're like uh, other people out there, well, isn't this just, you know, another adaption of Black Lives Matter? What's what's going on? And I want to assure why, you... Why, you know, why do you have a guy with a MAGA hat also having a hammer and sickle tattoo on his wrist with a raised fist? No, no, no. Uh, you know, you, you, know yeah. you, you get all these th silly commentaries or, or yeah. observations. If you believe in conspiracy theories, this is, this is a, a good example of where there could be a conspiracy. We don't know. Because I want to, as an amateur journalist, assure you, if there's one thing I have learned and told you for the last 10 years... First reports are always wrong. Always. I'm going to give you an example of a first report that's wrong. This is going to hurt. Some of you did not know this because the media does not correct first reports anymore. They used to, when New York Times would make a blunder, they had a page devoted to their blunders the week later. You would get all the stuff on Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, you know, the blah, 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 all the first reports. And then if they made a mistake, oh, by the way, we got this name wrong, or we had this event in the wrong order, we, we have a corrections page. The New York Times correction page isn't there anymore. And if it, if it is there, it's, we're sorry you read this wrong. That's what their correction page says now. It's ridiculous. But here, I'm going to tell you something that really, it's going to hurt. George Floyd died of the same thing Prince died of. He died from fentanyl overdose. When they did the autopsy and ran the lab results, he had 11 times the lethal dose of fentanyl in his body. Fentanyl leads to the filling of lungs with fluid and causes you to say, I can't breathe. Yes, at the same time, George Floyd met four really stupid police officers who had no idea what they were doing. They were rookies, and boom, we lost a city. Boom, we lost another city to burning down. We were all angry because we didn't thoroughly investigate what was really happening here. A person who was high on drugs met some bad police officers. He was not killed by the police. But boy, you know, they do play a small role in, and a role in this. But what was what you really thought happened didn't happen because the, the media didn't care. What I think people also are unaware of, and this is from some of the oh, reporting oh, oh, that is I want One second here. I'm going to post a link to the official autopsy report from the district attorney in Minneapolis in the show notes, just so you don't go, Kevin, what are you doing? Right. Okay, George. Minneapolis police officers, when they're arresting a suspect who is high on PCP or some sort of narcotic, are trained to place their knee on their neck and head. So part of the defense of the officer who's been arrested for uh, first degree murder is that he was only f going by the book. Now the book probably is wrong, mm -hmm. and because it, it, you know, this the whole issue is uh, well as as an, awful as an as but an the you know uh, you're right though medically you should not be putting your neck on a person who's obese like me uh, because it, it it does cause bigger issues. But so, in other words, the uh, the reporting is, you know, some of the defense is, A, here's the autopsy. B, the man was following exact police procedure. Uh, now, do you, do you see this being trumpeted? Of course not, because people have moved on to the next outrage. The policeman in Ferguson, Missouri, he was not guilty. Yeah, exactly. The policeman in Kenosha, Wisconsin, 
who we Not had the to. bishop in Milwaukee going on and on and on about oppression and this and that and the other justifiable shooting was the court's verdict a democratic district attorney who supports who took supports no black action runners, yeah who took no action to arrest and stop looters had to concede that there was nothing that the policeman in Kenosha did nothing wrong yet each and every initial response in the public following afterward was hysteria you can have Kamala Harris six months ago telling us that the rioters are justified and that they have righteous indignation and that we should understand their actions now the same woman who looks at the who looks at violence again tells us oh we should you know remove the president call in the national guard shoot these people this that and the other um there's a there's the amount of humbug and hypocrisy displayed by people across the spectrum uh it's more prominent with the mainstream media because they're on our face all the time but the amount of humbug that riding is okay when our people do it it's bad when the other side does it is uh is on display in these past few days and kevin you're right the only thing that we know is that we don't know what's happened well, and I don't and think what is happening. I think a year from now, you and I will have a great conversation about what happened at the U.S. Capitol, because we will know more. Um, mm -hmm. In fact, this is we never really talked about uh, what happened in Minneapolis, my hometown, or where, the place of my birth, uh, until now, because we didn't know anything. Now, mm -hmm. I, I read a report last week that the prosecutor in Minneapolis. Uh, is delaying the trial because he doesn't want the autopsy which is public but not uh, the the media hasn't uh, talked about it yet um to get out that uh, george floyd had taken a lethal dose of fentanyl before he was arrested so and yeah. i had a little per you know i think as our viewers have known one of my daughters lives in this area called Chaz or chop the capitol chop, hill yeah. area of uh Seattle and her mother Sue my wife would visit during these times where you would have the TVs going with these there's an autonomous collectivist Republic in the middle of Seattle well there's my wife going out to get pizza in the middle of an autonomous collectivist Republic and she's not noticing anything uh, yes the police station three blocks over was you know burnt to the ground but uh, the, the disconnect between what we're shown and what we're told and the facts and the grounds held by other observers now of course my wife and my daughter were not standing uh outside the police station as it was set on fire they weren't engaging in battles with the uh state the, the police troopers the police and state troopers but they were in an area that the world was telling us was in the epicenter of a domestic uprising and Susan's walking outside at 11 at night to get a pizza from the neighboring pizza parlor, which is still open. And still taking U.S. money. They're not taking jazz dollars or anything. Well, it's interesting. We talked about the, the Pravda-style news um, and the propaganda-style news. But I think we have really seen um, the media not care anymore. And I, this, I think back in, you know, the 70s they cared. Um, but I just, I think they've, and I think the last four years have caused them not to care, but I think they've lost interest in, in investigative reporting, in finding out the real story. I, I do believe, you know, Watergate was a real interest in finding the real story. You know, when um, the Washington, was it Times or Post, Post oh. back then, went after the story, there was, you know, we want to know what really happened. I don't think people really want to know what really happened at the U.S. Capitol. They got the perfect video, they got everything they want, um, and they showed you the video that you, they want you to see. That's that's the story, and we're sticking to it. Uh, we Our little part of the world was in the national news, uh, uh, besides having the world's largest pumpkin or uh, <laughs> watermelon, uh, we do get the news sometimes. Uh, the state of Florida uh, is distributing the COVID vaccine right now. And they've set up a very simple rule there. Those who are over 65 are first in line. 
Um, they're not giving it first to teachers or first to grocery store clerks or first to African Americans, as some states are doing. They're just doing this strictly by age, and they're rationing it across the the, the state, so that in our county uh, we have uh, fifty-five thousand people over the age of sixty-five, and we have five thousand doses for the first batch that arrived. And the county announced that we're going to take first come, first served, sixty-five or older, at the park, county park, uh, beginning on this day. And we had the national news because coming out, oh, Florida has mishandled the distribution of the vaccine because look at all these poor old people parking their cars overnight. These are the same 65-year-olds who park their cars overnight to get in line for the all-you-can-eat uh, buffet. buffet. Yes. <laughs> these are people who have nothing else to do and are healthy enough and want to go and park their car and get the first in line. They're the healthy 65-year-olds. Um, but my, my point is that the whole framing of the story was designed to make the Florida governor, who's been a, an outspoken, solid supporter of President Trump, look foolish. When the reality is that Florida has had an ex... Florida's hospital rate right now is actually lower at this time than it was in 2018 during the influenza last virus you know the, the the state the choices the state has made of allowing the market and allowing the counties to sort of make the on-the-spot decisions has proven to be effective at least here mm -hmm. um, we've mentioned in the past Kevin that uh, in Florida you wouldn't know that there's a COVID vaccine you do know in Connecticut <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, Connecticut is absolute shutdown. Um, I made the mistake of assuming when we drove back to, from Florida to Connecticut in a short 17-hour period, uh, nice drive, uh, that you know all operations were the same. If I went into a store in Florida, you 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 put your mask on and you walk in and you, you no know, big deal. When you walk in well, here, you, you stick out the liquor store after you do that. Yeah, you put you your mask on, on, bring out your shotgun, and <laughs> hi. Hi, I'm here for liquor, but you know, here in Connecticut, it is absolute still uh, freak down pandemonium. I went to get my blood drawn. Did I, did I talk about this last week? Whatever. And uh, it's they take your temperature here, they take your temperature at the, your pulse, they have you fill out this. Uh, um, the the dentist had me pay, fill out a seven page form uh, about any COVID um, uh, access I may have had. And I'm like, this is just ridiculous. If I had done the, I went to urgent care in Florida and they let Jill come in, you know, it was no big deal. You know, what did you do to your, oh, the cat, you, you're having an allergic reaction, go home. And so, you know, it, it's just completely different what they have here in Connecticut. And I think we have built in a, a set of fear. So the, the journalism class has figured out how they can treat people. They can tell you only what they want you to know. The government is now figuring out how well they can lock you down and you will be compliant. Here in Connecticut, people are very compliant uh, for the most part with what the government tells them because you will die from COVID. In Florida, they're much less compliant. There are less restrictions, but I think there's just more of an idea that uh, we don't believe government or whatever down in Florida. Here in Connecticut, it's a little different, George. We're also seeing the COVID ripple effect through the Anglican world. Some provinces, uh, many of the provinces have been having their uh, general synods or meetings of the House of Bishops, uh, many of them online. Um, others that are not as technologically sophisticated are having them socially distanced. Rwanda is in very tough straits financially. A Rwanda, the Rwandan church, they don't have direct deposit uh, giving and whatnot. They operate on the plate income they receive each Sunday. And they don't have deep pockets of inherited wealth. And when the government in Rwanda shut down the churches for the COVID, what that did was it cut off the income. So they're clergy that haven't been paid for six months in Rwanda. 
And in other words, the money they have, they're using it to keep the lights on and to, you know, feed the dying and run the, their clinics and all the things uh, that a church does are being severely impacted. And because of the travel restrictions, we're not really aware of this as we would be because we're not seeing mission trips from the West, from the UK, from England, Australia, uh, to the developing world uh, who can report back and basically bring with a sense of urgency what's going on. Um, the uh, Anglican, you know, Sudan, South Sudan held their House of Bishops meeting. It was an in-person meeting in Juba. And South Sudan is a Gafcon province, but my uh, contacts within the House, South Sudanese House of Bishops tell me that essentially nothing international was spoken of because the entire focus was South Sudan. Uh, now, they do happen to have a, a, a tribal war going on, so there's plenty to focus on. <laughs> but the no visiting bishops or archbishops from other provinces mm -hmm. no video welcomes from the archbishop of canterbury or foley beach or you know foley beach we go to this in the past or other anglican bishops so that what's happening is that the momentum of collegiality that had been built through the gafcon meeting uh has really much died apart from the primates level because you're not having that as good as communication can be technologically speaking I'm, I we still live in a world where most Anglican issues are resolved and discussed in a face-to-face -face setting because we're dealing with people from different cultures and right. we need that the filter of the screen just doesn't work when you're talking between America and Africa or Australia and uh, Burma well, no I mean that's that's a really good point you know, we rely very heavily now on video uh, in our first world countries, but the way, the, the greatest African model is not just to discuss it, but it is all, it's always solved. The solution is always done face to face. And mm -hmm. we just, that's not available right now. Now, I believe COVID will bring about a better church. I believe the church is going to learn something amazing from this. And how to really, really, uh, you know, establish better ways of communication, better ways of reaching out to their um, uh, parishes and uh, the people in the congregations. I think that this is that we're going to have a great COVID reawakening, and the churches that survive are going to do wonderful. I think, sadly, and I, you know, I hate to say this, but at least twenty-five percent, maybe thirty percent. Of churches in America will not fiscally survive COVID. That's hard to say, but uh, when this is all said and done, the loss of the plate income, the loss of um, uh, parishioners who don't return, and the loss of parishioners who've died from COVID, uh, you saw the same thing with the uh, Spanish flu. The church uh, suffered in attendance. You can see the same here. I, it hurts to say that. I think a better church will emerge. But we're one of the things, oddly enough, we saw after the Spanish flu. Uh, Spanish influenza ended this 1921, the same year that broadcasting, radio broadcasting, took off in the United right. States. And one of the first areas that really took off was religious broadcasting. And in the 20s and 30s, you had the rise of people like Amy Semple McPherson, and radio preachers were a phenomena unknown. Uh, before the First World War, the technology wasn't there. But there was that break in people's physical church going that created an opening for this new form of ministry. I've seen a break of now eight, nine months in my, I would have, you know, this time last year I had about 275 people physically showing up every Sunday. Right now, I've got 60 to 75. The other 200 assure me that they're watching on TV. Mm -hmm. I hope that's true. Sure. But how many of them are finding better preachers, 
better music, more, you know, they're at the Chinese restaurant of religion. You know, I'll take one from column A and one from column B. I and like her. I'll have yeah. steamed rice, not fried rice. And, mm -hmm. and, you know, I like the pageantry of the Episcopal Church. I like the preaching of... Uh, the, this Baptist minister from Atlanta. I like the music from this cathedral in uh, Los Angeles. And but people give them some, their packages. Well, they do. But uh, here, here's the winning church. I like the outreach ministry of those who reached out to me from the Los Angeles church or from the church in Washington State. You know, it's the it's not just the church that can produce well, it's the church that can meet the needs of the parishioners and to have these outreach programs where they're really in direct, audible and visual uh, contact with these people. It's not just putting the, together the package. In, in the end, it, it's you know, this is where the Jehovah's Witnesses, you know, always get their little marketing done. They reach out the handwritten letters of which I've gotten four from the JWs this this month. Uh, you know, just that that outreach that they have to reach the membership. Kevin, Those if you're going to stop in Florida trailer parks, you're going to get a Jehovah's Witness letter <laughs> under your <laughs> doorstep. Uh, <laughs> so, but well, there's you, some you, things you're right. Want. Yeah, I I agree. Actually, I agree entirely with you. Mm -hmm. But uh, but I balance that with the practical practicality. I'm visiting prisons. Uh, I have a funeral today. I have uh, a visit later that I'm going to make. A uh, prisoner gave birth to a child prematurely. It's at the uh, Children's Hospital in Orlando. Uh, child's probably not going to make it 17 weeks. I'm there, mm -hmm. uh, even though there's COVID and even though this and that and the other. I hate to say this, but the prisoner at the prison, the, the newly but with the premature baby, the uh, funeral of the 80 plus woman is not where the income of the church comes from. Right. And nor do the volunteers of the church. It's the old story of 20% do 80% of the work, 20% give 80% of the money. And the work amongst the 80% is growing exponentially. But that 20% core that the traditional Episcopal Church, which is my only uh, experience, that funded and provide the volunteer base, the people that would go with me to prisons, who would go visit the hospitals, who would go set up the flowers for the funeral, that is shrinking. And I'm not certain how to replace it with the younger generation who have lost the church going habit. No, that, very valid point is, you know, we've, we have lost the cores, you know, to a certain degree. Uh, our church still has the core. It, it may just be the Northeast, you know, how things work here. But uh, uh, things to, to really be aware of, keep your eyes open for, if you have a, any suggestions or what's happening in your church or your diocese, go to the comments section, let us know what works in COVID, what doesn't work. How is your church succeeding? How is your church failing? Please don't use names. Okay, we don't. You know, unless it's it's a good story. If if you're having trouble with your church, don't put the church name, please. Uh, okay, one story we haven't talked about yet this uh, season is Rabe, um, and it's a difficult topic. But George and I are willing to conquer and uh, take on difficult topics. Uh, because in Christian journalism, you need to be able to trust and rely on the people that you're watching on screen. And from time on time, uh, Christianity has um, uh, brought about wonderful leaders, wonderful apologists, wonderful preachers, teachers, worshipers, uh, hymn writers. And Ravi was one of those wonderful people, but he also had a fallen side that he failed to reveal. And one of the things you can see early on um, in many ministries and practices is lack of accountability. Uh, and when people suggested accountability to him without even knowing what was going on, he shrieked away and said, I don't need accountability. Come on, I'm Rave. What could possibly happen? And there's what happened. You always need accountability within your ministries. Uh, Billy Graham was famous to say, always keep me in prayer. 
that I would not be tempted by women, that I would not be tempted by money, that I would not be tempted by power or fame. Please, for the love of God, keep me in your prayers. And he set up an accountability. He had in his ministry that he would never be alone with a person of the opposite sex, ever, except for his wife. Uh, he would never have uh, single decisions over money. It was always done in, in the company of the board or the company of uh, accountability people. Uh, and he tried to be as humble as possible in his ministry. And it worked. We don't see any stories uh, about this man who uh, had a wonderful ministry for decades, generations, Billy Graham. We see other people who are asked to be accountable say, oh, all right, I can't do it this year, but we'll work on an accountability program next year. And next year never happens. Doesn't work that way, George. Uh, Rabbi Zacharias International Ministries, um, Rabbi Zacharias passed away last year. Mm -hmm. And I actually met him once. He was a speaker at an ACNA. Which, which Plano. One he, of the he, ACNA. He did the Plano one <clears throat> a couple years ago. Yeah, I, uh, you and I think I think we were there because um, I remember meeting very I, charismatic, yeah, sure. very personable, beautiful hair, beautiful teeth, beautiful message, wonderful preacher. I mean, I can't fault the ACNA for having this guy mm -hmm. because the package he presented was exactly what they wanted and needed. Uh, he was, was Indian at origin, then emigrated to Canada, and in recent years has been living in the United States and is a Canadian slash American dual citizen till his death. He has a few business ventures, which I think, I hate to say this, but they were massage parlors or something spas. along that line. Spas that were massage parlors in the wink, wink, nod, nod. Uh, you know, oh, let's go to Thailand and visit the massage parlors. You know, we all know what that means. And he engaged in, it was alleged by some of the women who ran the spas that he made sexual advances towards them that that they responded to. Uh, others did not. Well, this originally came up and everybody who knew him said, oh, this can't be true. This is awful. Well, Rabbi Zacharias International Ministries actually hired a law firm to investigate, and they found that there was evidence. Now, I know we live in an era where, unless it's proven in court, it didn't happen. Uh, but the evidence speaks to the allegations being more likely true than untrue. Well, so think... this wonderful minister was another, not a Jim Baker, in that there was no money involved. Uh, but let's say a, uh, oh, who was that other guy? Uh, Jimmy Swaggart. <laughs> Jimmy Swaggart, uh, where there was something going on on that side. Yeah, well, and here we come to the reality that uh, Kevin Coulson is a fallen individual. George Conger is a fallen individual. You do need to keep us in your prayers uh, that we do not uh, in any way allow temptations of this world to not embarrass us, but embarrass the God we serve. You know, Ravi and Ravi, the international ministries, they're going to suffer from this. But you know who suffers more? The gospel suffers in this. The, the people who relied on uh, Ravi and now are, are, are hurt and broken, and that affects their relationship with, with the Father. Well, this is mm -hmm. the story of the Jonathan Fletcher affair in the UK. Of evangel there, I don't know whether it's an evangelical tendency within the small e within the evangelical church, but churches of not having, not venerating the bishop, but creating priest kings or superstars that cannot be uh, um, questioned or challenged, be they a Joel Olsteins or Jonathan Fletchers or Ravi Zacharias's people you know, who uh, by the charisms that they have in public worship and ministry are untouchable uh, of criticism or oversight or review. Mm -hmm. This was the, and, you know, we need to applaud Ravi Zacharias International Ministries because they've essentially 
said, okay, folks, we need to close up shop because the guy after whom we're named, we cannot honor his memory anymore. Yeah. Whereas we, what the allegations in the Jonathan Fletcher affair are that the people in responsible positions within the establishment of the Church of England's evangelical wing knew, tolerated, and closed their eyes to these behaviors. That Jonathan Fletcher was still invited to be a conference speaker after he was publicly disciplined and lost his license to officiate. He still came to be a speaker. He still, his power was undiminished behind the scenes. Nobody was willing to hold him to being accountable. David Old has written about this uh, because there was another scandal with, I think, Hillsong yeah. in Australia of the evangelical. 2020 was the year that they really needed to get their house in order and bring in about accountability and transparency. It's not an American problem. It's not an English problem. It's not an Australian problem. It's a sin it's a problem. problem. Yeah, it's a sin yeah. problem. You know, and yeah, it it's disheartening as a fallen person to see other fallen people. You know, uh, Paul spoke about you know this so frequently. You know that um, in the end, it's it, it's the sin. It's it's not paying attention to what you're doing. It's not being accountable. Um, you know, Christianity works through encouraging the body, through building up one another, not from being an individual, uh, not from being uh, a person holier than thou. It doesn't work that way. That's that's that was the the fallen model of televangelism in the '70s and '80s, and uh, we don't need. We we now know exactly what does not work. Uh, as far as uh, international superstars in Christendom, George. And I hope we have no further examples. I pray we have no further examples. I pray that you pray for George and I that we not be those bad examples. Yes, that we have no problem with women, alcohol, <laughs> power, and fame. Right yeah. now, we don't. I, the, the women thing, not going to be a big deal, okay? <laughs> so, power, well, actually, fame, money. No, that's not, you know. Since I've lost weight, the, um, the caliber of fake Facebook account to women who, who you know, send you a picture they want to be a face, the caliber has gone up a little bit. That's, that's something you pray about. All right, George, we covered um, everything. I think uh, any other eruption. You know, we covered it all. Uh, so next year at this time, George and I will fully report on the U.S. Capitol insurrection, quote unquote. Uh, that'll be fun. Uh, until then, remember this is the great COVID reawakening for the church. Please pray that the church awakens. I'm Kevin Coulson, and I'm George Conger, and you've been watching episode six hundred thirty-nine of Anglican unscripted.